What comes to your mind when you hear the word poetry or when you think of poetry? I know for me, when I hear poetry, there's something inside me that feels upset maybe. I think back to English class in junior and senior high school trying to interpret all these different poems and what the teacher thinks it means and what you think it means and going through poem after poem I know is always my least favorite part of the English semester. But funny enough as it would have it, uh, God's led us to the place that we're going to be looking through some poetry uh, this summer. But not just any poetry, we're going to be looking through the poetry of the Bible. So that's where, where we're going to be sticking for the next several weeks. And while I normally did definitely dread that time in poetry and English class, my time in the poetry of the Bible has been very rich over the years. And I hope it has been for you as you've read through the poetry of the Bible as well. Whether it's reading through the story of Job, uh, receiving the emotional language of the Psalms and being able to really feel that, whether it's reading the wisdom of Proverbs, or receiving the numerous other things that can be gleaned from these wonderful books of the Old Testament. So I hope that our time in this series over the summer will be as much of a blessing for you as it has already been for me just in preparing for this first sermon. So for the first week, we'll be focusing on the first chapter of Job. So you can turn there if you like. We'll be reading through it in a moment here. Um, this is a passage I've always appreciated reading and I've felt drawn to over the years. Uh, the book of Job was always my dad's favorite book in the Bible. And because of that, the message of Job also helped carry me through the time of grieving his passing several years ago. But if you have never read this book, I encourage you to carefully read it in your own time but also just receive these words today and consider how the words of Job, the story of Job, can apply to your situation, to your life as you are right now. Just before we get into it, I just want to give a little bit of introduction if there is unfamiliarity with this book. Um, in the study notes in my Bible, an introduction has this to say about the book. The book of Job reminds God's people that they have an enemy who will denounce them in Satan. And through the ignorance of Job's friends, it helps the faithful to remember at all times how smart, how small a part of any situation is the fragment, the fragment that they see. So there's always so much going on beneath the surface of what we might see going on in a person. This helps believers to trust and obey amid life's perplexities. And it enables the faithful to support and encourage one another in a spirit of tenderness and humility. So we won't be going through the whole book of Job, but as we go, even just through this first chapter, I hope that you'll see these things and hear these things and be challenged and encouraged by that. It gives us an idea of what to expect. And as we'll get into this first chapter, we'll see that Job is put forth as a very special man, one whom there was no other like him on the earth, as is said here. But even as he's considered this special man, the one put forth by God, may we still consider what we can learn from the situation that he finds himself in. So we'll break it down into the three sections of the chapter. First, we hear the introduction about Job's character and we hear about his wealth. Second, we hear the dialogue um, between Satan and God as he is allowed to test Job. And lastly, we see Satan take Job's property and his children, and we also hear Job's reaction and see how he reacts to what happens. So with this in mind, let's dive in and let's read the chapter before we get into it. Job chapter 1. In the, in, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Verse 6. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people. And they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Wow. Just dwell on those words. Think on those words. We're going to be looking through it, but I encourage you really to let them sit and to sink in. It's just such a powerful story that we see in this chapter, this first chapter. So let's focus in on this first section where we see the description of Job and we hear about him and who he is. In the first verse, we hear this description of Job. First, that he is called blameless and upright. It's important to note that this description was also said of two other very well-known people in the Old Testament. Both Noah in Genesis chapter 6 and Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, both of them were also called blameless and upright. So in this description, he's being placed in the same vein as these forefathers of the Israelite nation. The second part that we hear in this description is that he feared God and he turned away from evil. If you look throughout the book of Proverbs, these descriptions, someone who fears God and someone who turns away from evil, describe someone who is wise. So just in this quick description that we hear, that he was blameless and upright, that he feared God, and that he turned away from evil, we know, taken in with the rest of the Old Testament, the rest of the scriptures, that Job was a special man, both in his faith in God and also in the wisdom that he possessed. Not only this, but later in the chapter we hear God speak of Job, saying that there is none like him on the earth. And again, God, the Lord repeats that, he is one who is blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. So this was not only his reputation from those around him, but this was how God viewed him as well, which is of utmost importance. So we hear this about his character. We hear about who God, who Job is. And second, we hear of his wealth and status among the people. He had a large family, he had many livestock, and he had many servants, which all are signs of wealth and blessing in that culture and in that day. He is called here the greatest of all the people of the East. What an amazing testimony this man had in just these three brief verses that we say, see at the beginning. Thinking of this and thinking of this rich man who was blessed by God, but also feared God and turned away from evil and looked to the Lord constantly. It's amazing. It, it's hard to imagine that this man with immense wealth and property would be known, first of all, for his virtue, his character, and his dedication to God. 
that the first thing said about him wouldn't be about his riches, but about how much he loved and worshipped God. As we see in our world, as we see in our culture today, many who would be called great in our world today, the rich and the famous, Many would certainly not be first described as being blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Yet this is how Job was known. This is how we see Job being described. And then at the end of this first section, we have these verses where it says that Job would also go and offer burnt offerings for his children in case they had sinned or cursed God in their hearts. So not only was Job known as this person who feared God, but he was a caring father who took his role as the leader of the family seriously. Further to this point, in the Tyndale commentary on Job, the author says, As the head of the family, Job was a priest with God. And it's interesting that this sin, which he fears that they might commit, which is cursing God in their hearts, is the very one that Satan hopes Job will fall into, that you see later in chapter 1 and also in chapter 2, and also what his wife will tempt him to do. As his wife see all that it, sees all that has happened and she tells him to just curse God and die. So these things that he is praying for his children to not do is the same things that others are tempting him to fall into. So we've looked at this first section, we've heard about Job, we've heard about who he is, we've been introduced to him and his family. So next we hear this section of where Satan is speaking with the Lord. In verse 6, we hear that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. In the, my Bible, again, it says, it describes them as heavenly beings that were gathered before God like a council before a king. And the phrasing here is that the sons of God came to present themselves and Satan also came among them. Again, in the Tyndale commentary about here, it says that in many places, the preposition, the word among, is used to refer to an intruder. It is because Satan has no right to be there that he alone is asked his business. He is the one that God addresses first. He addresses Satan and asks him, he says, from where have you come? Again, it implies that he's not expected to be there, that he is the only one being addressed first by God. And Satan replies that he has come from going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down on it. And hearing this phrase, it sounds a lot like a verse in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, which says, Your adversary the devil, or Satan, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So this is not explicitly said here in Job that this was his reason for going to and fro and what he was doing, but it can be implied from what we know about who Satan is. We know that Satan is the accuser, as he is called in Hebrew and in other places in the Bible. We also know that he tempts people, as, we, as you can see in Genesis with Adam and Eve in the garden. We also see Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness and in other cases as well. He tempts them to try to get them to sin against God and disobey the words that have been given to them. So we come to verse 8, where God, knowing this about Satan, knowing who he is, knowing what he is trying to do, puts forward his servant Job, this man who is blameless and upright, this man who fears God and turns away from evil. God puts him forward, knowing Job's character and knowing who he is. As it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So as we can see from this scripture, from this verse in 1 Corinthians, God did not put forward Job just so that he would be this person who would fail and this person who would fall into sin. Rather, trusting that this temptation, knowing that this temptation placed before Job would not be beyond his ability to be tempted, Job puts him forward, knowing that he would still look to God, even in his most dark and difficult moment. But we see that after God says this about Job, Satan makes his own claim, saying that the only reason that Job chooses to worship God is because he's been so protected by the Lord in everything, that he's been blessed immensely. He has property, family, riches, everything a person could want. But Satan claims that if all this is taken from Job, 
he will curse God. Now, think about this yourself. Hopefully this would not be the case for us. That if we were to lose everything, that we would, well, curse God. I hope that wouldn't be the case, but we'll continue to consider that and look at that as we move through here. We should try to imagine what Job was going through. Try to put yourself in his shoes, losing everything in a moment. It's just hard to imagine what he was dealing with, but it's amazing to see his reaction. So again, as we already heard, God believed that his servant Job would remain faithful, even in the midst of tremendous loss, even with all he's dealing with. So he, has, he says that Satan is free to remove Job's possessions, anything that he has, but that he is not allowed to do anything to Job himself, at least not in this first chapter. Again, something that is not explicitly said in this exchange, but can be implied as you look at the exchange of words here, is the authority that God has over Satan. Satan falls under him. He is, Satan is not equal in power to God. Let me repeat that. Satan is not equal in power to God. It is not a case of two equal forces fighting back and forth, like the light side and the dark side in Star Wars. It's not a superhero and his arch, enemy, his arch enemy going back and forth and wondering who's going to win. God has full authority over Satan. This is always important for us to remember, to never forget. If you've ever taken a look at the book of Revelation and you hear of the, the battle between Satan and his armies. Satan has all his armies, all his demons with him preparing to fight and then they're just wiped out in a moment. It's not, it's not an epic war lasting years and years. It's a moment and it's done. And that we can see the power of God, the authority of God that he has over Satan. God is the most powerful being in existence and it's not even close. So I hope that we can remember that and that we can see that as we look at this chapter. So now we come to this final, this final section of this chapter. We've seen the description of who Job is. We've seen this exchange, and now we come to Satan taking away these things and Job's reaction. And we see this process over several verses of Satan taking away Job's livestock, his servants, his children. The way they phrase it, it's just the servant comes and the next one's there, 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 there. In a matter of moments, Job has lost everything. All the things that made him a rich, a blessed man in his day, in his culture, were taken away from him in a moment. Again, try to put yourself in Job's shoes or maybe his sandals here as we imagine this. Everything you have is taken away. Your house, your children, your retirement fund, your golf clubs, your car, your trailer, your pets, everything you own, everything you treasure, the people you hold most dear to you, gone in an instant. Be honest with yourself. Think to yourself, how would you react? I can't really imagine being in that situation. It's hard to imagine. But I can imagine that I would just feel like giving up. Not really knowing how or what to feel. Because when we experience a loss, even just a single loss, it can lead us to that place where we don't know how to feel. We don't know what to feel. We have all these emotions and we don't know where to turn or where to go or what to feel. But how do we see Job react here? In verse 20, you can see, it says there, that Job arose, he tore his robe, and he shaved his head, and he fell on the ground and worshipped. So it's important to see and hear that there's two sides to this reaction. First is one of grief, a natural human reaction. He tears his robe and he shaves his head, both seen throughout the Bible as signs of mourning. A person being in mourning. And it's absolutely expected that when facing such a terrible tragedy, you would be in mourning. That would be a reaction. But second, we hear that he worshipped. That was his immediate reaction, was that he worshipped. If, if you're familiar with the story in 2 Samuel, with King David, we see a similar reaction. He sinned against God. He took another man's wife. And the baby that was to be born, God told him that this baby would not survive. The baby would die. But David is in the temple praying, praying, praying that God would spare his son. And then he is finally told that the child has died. And immediately, David 
gets out of his morning clothes, out from where he's been praying and mourning, and he goes into the house of the Lord and he worships God. And the same thing we see here with Job. It's certainly a more unexpected reaction. We expect the grief, the grief that comes. But for him to simply fall on the ground and worship is just so amazing. Perhaps we can't imagine reacting this way in our own darkest moment. But in this, Job shows that even as he has lost everything, everything that made him rich, everything that Satan said is the reason for him loving God, trusting God, worshiping God, even when he loses all that, he still loves, he still trusts God. Thinking of my own life, I'm so thankful that God has carried me through some of the darkest moments of my life thus far. Again, as I look at this passage, I can't help but think of my own father, as he would often, again, refer to this as one of his favorite passages in the Bible, that a man who lost everything could still turn to God in that moment of tremendous loss. And just remembering back to my own loss when I lost my dad, experiencing all these emotions, grief, anger, sadness, frustration, not knowing where to turn, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go. But I turned to God through prayer and through His Word. And I don't say this to paint myself in some kind of special light, like I have the formula figured out or a perfect example or anything of the sort, but rather only to focus on God's goodness and God's faithfulness to me in the midst of the most difficult of times, the most darkest times. Because in the days, in the months, in the years since then, I've struggled with doubts and times where I felt far from God. But looking back, I will always be so thankful for the time when God carried me through my darkest moment. And not only do we hear that Job falls down and worships, but immediately in the following verse, in verse 21, we hear Job continue. He says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then in verse 22 it said, Job, In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Again, I'm thinking of my dad from those words, my dad's favorite song came out of those words, uh, Blessed be your name. That you give and take away, you give and take away, but my heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. What a statement that is in itself as well. Recognizing all that Job had was a gift from the Lord, and now it's been taken away. He will still bless the Lord. Do we recognize this? Do we recognize and remember that all we have, our possessions, our time, our family, everything that we have received is all a gift from God and it could be taken in a moment? I feel like sometimes we feel a certain entitlement to some of these things. Like we've worked so hard. We've worked our whole lives to earn these things. We deserve it. We deserve a healthy family. We deserve all the things that we have. We've worked so hard. But if we could live a life of gratitude Instead of a life of entitlement, what a blessed life we would live. For we deserve nothing. Let's make that clear. We deserve nothing. That everything we receive is a gift from God. As a matter of fact, not only do we deserve nothing, as we are all sinners here today, we can all say that we have sinned. Not only do we deserve nothing, but we deserve death. We deserve punishment for our sins. As it says in the book of Romans, the wages of sin is death, which is what we deserve. Yet, even in our darkest, our lowest, even as we are deserving of death, God in His infinite grace and mercy and love does not leave us in that place. He offers us what we do not deserve. He offers us a gift that we could never hope to earn or pay back, which is salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. The greatest gift that we could ever receive, which is eternal life with God. And not only this, not only does He offer us eternal life, but He blesses us beyond belief, with what, beyond what we could ever deserve again, with rich lives, and gives us all that we need as the, our great provider. So maybe next time we want to complain, next time I want to complain about what I don't have, what I want, what I'm struggling with, Instead of complaining, we should instead remember with gratitude what our Lord has done for us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. And blessed be your name. Let's pray. Lord God, you are so good to us. God, we cannot 
thank you enough for all that you have done for us, Lord God. And as we hear of this, this man, Job, who was this blessed man on the earth, who lost everything, Lord, in his darkest moment, he turned to you. He worshipped you, Lord God. And we thank you for the example that we can hear, that we can look at this morning. And I pray that it would not be something that we feel is unattainable, but rather that we can see and learn from him that even as we experience loss or even as we experience great joy, that we would look to you with gratitude, remembering who you are and all that you bless us with each and every day. Just for another day to live, Lord, we are extremely blessed. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Um, there's going to be a video playing. And